All right, hey guys, I'm Ian, I'm an anesthesiologist. Today I'm gonna to be going over doing an awake intubation under topical anesthesia only. Um, this makes a pretty cool party trick, but it's also clinically relevant. Um, I'm not, not gonna spend a lot of time going over the ASA difficult airway algorithm, but if you're at all from familiar with that, um, you know, you, part of the decision tree is consideration of awake intubation. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways to go about doing this. Um, in practice, most people will use a little bit of sedation, but if you use adequate uh, topicalization and or uh, a couple nerve blocks, then it's possible to do it under local only. Um, obviously, patient selection is important for this, and most pediatric patients aren't gonna tolerate it. People with cognitive impairment probably won't tolerate it, and some people are just super anxious. So, you know, doing a local only technique uh, probably won't be successful. That being said, you know, most patients, if you explain to them the indication for it and kind of walk through what to expect, uh, you know, they will buy in, uh, and the technique is a great thing to have in your tool bag. So, some scenarios that you might want to consider this, uh, you know, potentially. Now this list isn't exhaustive, but you know, potentially like an unstable C-spine, somebody with very poor neck range of motion, um, people with like angioedema uh, or history of head and neck cancer with prior uh, neck radiation. Um, off the cuff, those are some of the scenarios that I've seen or personally used this technique. Um, otherwise, you know, anytime you have concern for a potentially difficult airway, depending on your resources, um, this may be the uh, uh, safest or certainly most conservative technique that you can use. So um, as far as uh, actually executing this, so there's lots of different ways to go about it. It's usually helpful to give uh, a little bit of glycopyrrolate or another anti sialagog about 20 minutes or so beforehand. So uh, I uh, administered 0.2 milligrams of glycopyrrolate about 20 minutes ago, which is starting to dry out my mouth. I'm going to have one of my colleagues do a transtracheal block here. Um, that'll help to anesthetize below the vocal cords um, in the territory of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The other two nerves you need to block for this to be successful are the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, if people are interested, I'm more than happy to do a more in-depth dive into the anatomy and relevant considerations for doing this. But I think in a nutshell, that's uh, kind of what you need to know. Uh, at this point, uh, I'll give a word to our sponsors, NordVPN. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I know people do that in YouTube videos. This is my first one. But, um, all right, my friend's going to uh, go ahead and do this transtracheal block, and then we'll proceed here with the topicalization. All right, so as far as doing the transtracheal block, you know, laying somebody supine with the neck extended if possible is helpful. Um, I have a pretty prominent laryngeal cartilage, so it, or thyroid cartilage, so it's pretty uh, easy to find the landmark. Um, if somebody doesn't have good neck range of motion or they're obese, it can be tricky. Um, but what you want to do is palpate and uh, hopefully delineate where the cricoid cartilage is inferior to the thyroid cartilage. And then after cleaning the skin, go through and inject. So uh, my friend's going to demonstrate that here. <clears throat> Coughing's good. Helps to spread it up and get the bottom of the cords. All right, now, so that uh, was a transtracheal block. Um, people are going to cough when you do that. That's good. That helps to aerosolize the local. Um, next, uh, I'm going to try something a little bit different than what I've done in the past. Hopefully this works. If not, I've got a backup plan. Uh, it's always good to have plan A, B, C, and uh, you know, hopefully this looks smooth. If not, then it'll help add some extra stuff to your toolkit. So what I've got here is some 2% viscous lidocaine. 
what I'm gonna do, uh, you can hear I'm a little bit hoarse now from my vocal cords getting anesthetized, so that's totally normal. Uh, I'm gonna gargle some viscous 2% lidocaine, and uh, what that's gonna do is uh, hopefully anesthetize the distribution of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, that's mostly important in that it uh, will block the afferent limb of the gag reflex. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's, you really want a dense uh, glossopharyngeal nerve block. Um, that can be the trickiest one to get because, uh, uh, you know, the salivary glands, even with the glyco, you know, there there's, tends to be some pulling of saliva. Um, back at the uh, edge of the tongue. So if I need to uh, numb that further, I'll show you how to go about doing that. Otherwise, hopefully this will knock it out. And then when I swallow it, it'll go down uh, into the uh, like hypopharynx region and help to anesthetize the internal branch of this superior laryngeal nerve. So let's give this a shot here. Another thing I need to know, uh, you know, you wanna be cognizant of your total cumulative local anesthetic dose. Um, the injectate for the transtracheal block was 4% lidocaine. You know, it's 40 milligrams per ml, so uh, it can be pretty easy to exceed the safe uh, threshold for that. You know, when you're doing this technique, just keep in mind how much total you've administered. We did three mls and I'm about 80 kilos, so I can get about on the order of like 360 uh, milligrams total of lidocaine. Uh, I've had 120 so far. I'm going to be kind of conservative here. Uh, if I start seizing, then we'll get to demonstrate uh, intralipid resuscitation. So. All right, so it's been about two minutes. Um, I gargled a couple cc's of the viscous lidocaine and sprayed some along the lateral borders of my tongue. So um, a good spot if you want to anesthetize the glossopharyngeal nerve uh, in a targeted fashion is to go along the lateral border of the tongue and find where it meets the palatoglossal fold. Um, you know, you can do an injection there. I've never done that. Um, you know, the risk with that would be, uh, you know, you're in the vicinity of the carotid artery by a couple centimeters. Personally, I'm not willing to buy that risk. Um, and you can very easily topicalize it. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I've got a, a tongue depressor here uh, with some gauze wrapped around it. Um, you know, not a beautiful setup, but I'm going to test my gag reflex. I've got the gauze as my backup plan if I still have a residual gag reflex. I've got uh, some 2% lidocaine jelly I'm going to put on there and try to paint, uh, you know, the gutter back by the palatoglossal fold to uh, more deeply anesthetize the glossopharyngeal. So let's go ahead and test here. So a little bit of a gag reflex still. Uh, so what I'm going to do is put a little bit of this on here and then try to paint back there. Okay, there's one side. And wear gloves if you're doing this on a patient. Hopefully that goes without saying. Good times. All right, we'll give that a little bit to marinate there. All right, so my plan with the viscous lidocaine, you know, maybe I'm just impatient, but it didn't work quite as planned. You know, th this video isn't going to be as uh, streamlined as some of the other ones out there, but hopefully it's a more realistic, uh, you know, portrayal of how this can go. Um, I'm in a kind of resource constrained environment here, so I don't have a lot of the tools that I might use um, uh, otherwise. But anyway, what I'm going to do as my fallback is drop uh, two cc's of 4% lidocaine, yeah, let's do three cc's of 4% lidocaine, and I'm going to gargle this. 
uh, see if that can get a deeper block here. Yeah, this isn't a video on proper needle safety. Uh, all right, we're gonna go ahead and give this a shot. Uh, it's been a couple minutes since I did that additional dose of 4%. So I got here is my fiber scope, uh, 70 ET tube, I'm gonna preload it. Um, I've got my syringe for the cuff, and then I threaded the epidural catheter through the working port um, with the syringe with uh, like three and a half cc's of 4% Lido on it. Um, what that's for is if there's any hot spots uh, as we're going in, we can drip it on uh, to try to further anesthetize that. So uh, let's go ahead and give this a go here. All right, so here you can see that Ian is breathing through an ET tube. He can't talk because the tube is in between his vocal cords, but he can maintain his airway. He's ventilating, no issues. And that's how you intubate yourself. All right, well, hopefully that was uh, educational for you guys um, and maybe a little bit entertaining. Uh, you know, there's other videos out there that go a lot smoother than uh, my attempt here did but you know sometimes that happens in real life and you got to have backup plans so hopefully seeing what I did to you know correct some of the residual gag reflex was helpful for you um, you know if, if you guys are interested um, then uh, put it in the comments uh, um, I'm more than happy to do another video that kind of goes through some of the other techniques that are available some of the anatomy and uh, situations where this technique might be beneficial um, you know, if you're, uh, you know, trying to get good at medicine, uh, hit that subscribe button. Uh, and then if you like this video, um, smash that like button and, uh, you know, we'll, we're here for you. Try to, uh, enhance your education. So, um, with that, hopefully this was helpful and, uh, see you next time, maybe.